What subjects are covered in the Bible that you believe are actually beneficial to mankind? Well, a lot of those subjects are subjects that I taught in the first century. So if we look at the subject of being born again, having a relationship with God, that is a primary subject where I feel people need to understand far more about it. You know, there's many of my quotations and many of my illustrations in the Bible were surrounding this particular subject. And most people who interpret those particular metaphorical illustrations do not understand the metaphor, unfortunately. Um, so I feel that is the primary area, the, the, the area surrounding having a relationship with God and, uh, and desiring God's love and, and entering into this beautiful relationship uh, where you give and receive with God. And that is, to me, the primary important thing that's contained within the Bible. It, it, it's the only book, the only holy book that contains such a thing. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, um, it is a special book in, in, and unique in that regard. Um, there are many other books written about ethical behaviour, but, but the Bible contains this unique thing about relationship with God. I also feel the Bible's portrayal of ethical behaviour, uh, based on my words in the first century, is also very, uh, very important. This is the whole concept that, you know, do unto others what you would like them or what you would have them do to you very important principle of love. But in that you're clarifying it's what you taught, so not everything that the Bible says about ethics, it's really what you taught about ethics. Yes, although there are other things the Bible says about ethics that are very beautiful as well, like in the book of Proverbs, for example, in Ecclesiastes, the Old Testament of the Bible, there are many ethical statements that are made that if a person practices them, they do well in developing their love as a result of practicing those particular ethical things. So I believe there are, there are a lot of ethical statements in the Bible. The problem is there is also a lot of unethical ones yeah. and the person needs discernment to be able to choose or, or, or work out the difference between the two. Mm -hmm. If a person just accepts the Bible completely as God's word, then they're not going to do that. And then they're also going to be very confused about how they engage ethics and how they engage love. They become confused. They think some things are loving that are not. And then, you know, and that are obviously not if they look at them by themselves without the Bible's influence. And then there's other things that they believe are, are not loving that actually are, you know, and unfortunately, you know, that causes a distortion for many people who believe in the Bible. Mm. So that, you know, there are, two, there are two areas, I feel, but the most important of those areas, the most important area is this area of relationship with God, uh, as I described it in the first century. The importance of prayer, as I described it in the first century, not as the Lord's Prayer, because that's not what I uh, actually described. That was said after I, I lived on earth. Mm -hmm. And there are certain things contained within it that I did say, but the, the so-called Lord's Prayer were things that were mentioned after I died by some of the other people, some of, you know, even some of my disciples uh, come up with that kind of a prayer. That wasn't the prayer that I recommended to my disciples at the time. Um, but, but, you know, there, there were, the importance of prayer was a very important factor because prayer is the opening of the soul, the desire of the soul to receive love. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I'm talking now about the love from God. So I feel prayer is a very important part of the Bible, but there's a, there's a poor portrayal in the Bible of what prayer actually is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are many other things about the, what the Bible contains too that, that I feel are important to understand. There are some issues of morality that are important to understand. Um, of course, some of them get severely distorted and then turned into laws and then get punished. Mm -hmm. You get punished if you don't practice them and that, that is not in harmony with love at all. God very rarely, if ever, punishes a person for practicing an unloving behavior, but the person themselves does have the law of God constantly attempting to correct them. In other words, God's laws constantly demonstrate to the person through the person's condition that what they're engaging in is unloving. But there is the presumption as well that certain things that man has made are what God's opinions are. For example, marriage is one of those. You know, man's opinion is that to be moral, you have to be married. And that's not God's opinion. God uh, created a marriage between the two halves of the soul. 
And so you might marry in paper another person who's not your soul mate, but at the end of the day, uh, that's not the person you're gonna end up with in the long term. Mm -hmm. And uh, while you may have a moral relationship with that person in the sense that you know they're the only person you engage with sexually, um, in the end, they're not the only person you're going to engage with sexually because if they're not your soulmate, you're going to finish up leaving them at some point in the future, either on earth or in the spirit world. Mm -hmm. And you will eventually find your soulmate at some point if you truly engage God's truth. So, you know, there are many things in the Bible that are quoted as essential. Um, but, but obviously, if you think about it from God's perspective, God didn't have a piece of paper when he put the first human couple together. <laughs> um, you know, love is the binding fa fa force that should bind pe people together. So I suppose from what you're saying, the question is what, what do you find beneficial in the Bible? And you've mentioned this teaching of the possibility of becoming born again. At one with your, God, yeah. At one with God through your relationship with God. The possibility of God's love transforming your soul into a new creature. I referred to this constantly in the first century. My illustrations in the Bible still contain some references to it, if a person knows how to interpret them, of course. Um, so, you know, I think that's a very important part. Mm. So, so you mentioned that, you mentioned prayer, you mentioned ethics and you mentioned morality. Yep. But honestly, listening to you, every single one of them seems, you're saying there's aspects of it, but it's flawed. There's yes. aspects of it, but it's flawed. There's aspects of it, but it's not the complete truth. And of so course, you, you know, when I talk about, for instance, relationship with God, if you believe you're having a relationship with a wrathful, punishing God who's going to destroy the wicked, then you're flawed because mm. there is no such God. No, that, that God doesn't exist except in man's minds. You mm -hmm. know, it doesn't exist anywhere else and certainly is not the true God that I have met and have a relationship with. It does not have any of those desires. So, so you know, if you take everything the Bible says about God, you're not going to have a very good relationship with God. Mm. If you take everything the Bible says about me, you're not going to have a very good relationship with me. <laughs> Yeah. If you take everything the Bible says about people generally, you're not going to have a very good relationship about, with people generally. If you take everything that the Bible says about women, you're not going to have a good relationship with a woman. Yeah. You know, and these, these are the flaws that are within the Bible. I see. Yeah. And so it, it is difficult. I just honestly, I, I respect that there's a benefit and I quite enjoy reading the Bible personally at different times. But it does seem very um, a difficult situation for someone who's put all of their belief system based in a book. Oh, I agree. For somebody who's put all of their belief system based on the Bible as the book of, of God, then it's certainly a difficult mm. situation. I agree. If, if somebody, though, treats it more openly, any book that you read, and if I say this to everyone, every, any book that you read, if you read it with an open heart and you read it from the position of wanting to become more loving and wanting to become more truthful and wanting to become more developed inside of your soul, then you'll find that there's certain things in the book you can dismiss and there's certain things in the book that are interesting. Mm. The same applies to the Bible. Now, I feel the same applies to the Bible to the most in the sense that the Bible contains things about becoming at one with God. Not many other books on the planet contain that. There are a few other books now that do. You know, for instance, the Paget Messages are one of those things that have been turned into a book that do contain the truth about becoming at one with God now. Mm -hmm. but, but not many people know about these books. Mm -hmm. uh, there's not many books aside from that, not common books that people could learn about becoming at one with God. So mm -hmm. the Bible is a very important book to read on that basis. Yes. Yes. You know, there's not very many books that uh, discuss ethics in a true open manner, although that's improving. You know, there's more and more people interested in ethical behaviour, so there's more books being written as a result. Mm -hmm. um, the same applies to, I feel, to women. There's many books on the planet that you'd be better off reading about the equal treatment of men and women than the Bible, because mm -hmm. the Bible does not portray that subject very well at all. So, you know, <laughs> um, like any book, it requires analysis through a condition of love. And you ba but basically you're saying there is a higher benefit because it has this teaching about... The becoming becoming at one with God. Yeah. It's the only book up until, you know, 100 years ago, it was the only book that mm. contained the principle of becoming at one with God. Uh, at one with God. And there, so therefore is a very important book for somebody to put in their reading list. Yeah. But... Uh, that being said, there are many false things in, contained within the book as well. Mm. Thank you.
the, what many of the spirits who have, who have believed in the Bible on the earth want to have happen is they want the Bible to either be God's word or not. So they can either throw it away or believe the whole thing. Yeah. And, you know, what that does is remove the personal responsibility to be able to make a choice and decision based upon love. So this desire to either have a book that either is definitely true and I should read it or definitely not true and I should never touch it. Um, and I can't say both of those things about the Bible. It's, I feel quite strongly it's definitely not true. However, there's a lot of things in it you should read. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I feel quite strongly about that. And, and so I can't say don't read it at all. And I can't say don't believe everything. Uh, I can't say do believe everything in it. Yes. And many of the spirits who have passed over, who have been Christian while they're on earth, want either one or the other answer. And you can't give one or the other answer because there are things contained within it that are beautiful and there are things contained within it that are very harsh and unloving. And, and you need to have discernment, personal discernment, to tell the difference. Mm -hmm. And the personal discernment comes from your relationship with God, not your relationship with the Bible. Right? It comes from your desire for truth, not from your relationship with the Bible. You know, in the Bible said, the truth will set you free. And I did actually say that. It's your relationship with truth that sets you free, not the relationship with the Bible that sets you free. It's your relationship with love that sets you free, not the relationship with the Bible that sets you free. So, so if you're truly going to analyse the Bible, you need to analyse it like you analyse any other book. You need to forget about analysing it as if it's totally God's word, and you need to see it as the word of men However, it contains many of the highest possible truths you could ever imagine. It does. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, it's very beneficial to read. I feel that my feelings match yours on that subject. Mm. But it's interesting being an interviewer, whenever we discuss religious matters, uh, Christian religious matters, I feel I become a medium, a channel. Yeah. A channel. Like suddenly, there's all, there's all these questions that come to me from Christian that, spirits, that, and there's a lot of there's a lot of impression or pressure on me to to ask the questions, to continue a line of questioning with you, which is and that's not what's okay. On my, uh, and that's okay. Yeah. yeah, like I'm happy to continue a line of questioning, um, you know, about some of their questions, but uh, I, I feel a lot of the times we need to understand that some of the questions are driven from this emotional dissatisfaction with the answer that's already given. Yes. So, you know, many, many Christian spirits who now know the Bible does not contain all of the truths of God, now want to throw the whole Bible out. And I can't recommend that they do that because mm -hmm. uh, there are many things in the Bible that if they understood them completely, it would help their lives immensely. So I can't recommend that somebody does that. Um, that's what I'm saying. I have a much more middle of the road acceptance of all books on their planet than the majority of people do, because I realise there are so many things that um, can be said and done. Yeah. You know about the different the, about the different books that are beneficial to human life and beneficial to understanding your relationship with God and your relationship with others. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and I feel like a lot of people panic about. Oh, how do I do it right? If I haven't been doing it right, how do I do it right? And it's and if they skipping. do that, all it is is they are panicked about getting things right, yeah. and that is an emotion. Right? What that what's that emotion about? That emotion is actually about worrying that if they get something wrong, they're going to be punished. Mm. Now, where did that come from? Well, it's in the Bible. That that you know there is this principle in the Bible: you do something wrong, and there's some people in the Bible that mistakenly did things wrong and they were punished. Mm. And the, and a person reading that goes, whoa. I'm now quite afraid of doing something wrong. Now, I'm saying to people, you don't need to be afraid of doing anything wrong. God doesn't punish like that. Yeah. God looks at everything in terms of the intention, right? So, so, you know, even concepts like fear of a punishing God in, impact upon a person's ability to go, I don't have to worry about that. And why have they got a fear of a punishing God? Because they had a fear of a punishing parent. Yeah. That's one of the primary reasons why they accept a punishing God as a God that exists, which does not exist, but they accept it exists because they had a punishing parent who told them, 
I'm giving you a belt and right now, but I love you. Yeah. In other words, I'm punishing you right now. I'm causing violence towards you right now, but I love you. And this is an expression of my love. That's a distortion of love. And distortions of love in our childhood cause us to accept distortions of love in a God that we worship. Yeah. And we need to understand the correlation between those two things. I feel if I believe in a, in a, you know, that love allows punishment, then I will believe in a God that allows punishment. If I do not accept that love allows punishment under any circumstances, love allows correction, but not punishment. Right? There's a big difference between correction and punishment. Love allows, pun if I believe love allows punishment and particularly violent punishment, then I am out of harmony mm. myself with one of the principles of love. But I will accept a God who punishes. I will accept an angry, wrathful God who punishes. Such a God does not exist. I've never met such a God. And I don't have a relationship with any God like that. And, uh, and, but I feel that many people on earth do. Mm. They have created a God of their own imagination who really mirrors angry men on earth. Yeah. And is not higher than the average person on earth. Mm. 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 Yeah, thank you.